okay, let's talk about hunting breach credentials and let's get hands on. Now, before we get started, I know I stressed this in the beginning of the course. I'm going to stress this again. What I'm going to show you here could change. Now, I released a course about a year ago, which was on ethical hacking. We talked about breach credentials and I utilized a website called WeLeak Info. WeLeak Info was then eventually shut down and I got all kinds of emails saying, hey, this is shut down. I don't know what to do. There's more out there. OK, there's always more out there. What I'm showing you is the methodology. I could show you on a specific website, which I'm going to do. That website could go down tomorrow. We never know. But what you need to retain is the thought process and the methodology behind what's about to happen. From there, you could take that and utilize it elsewhere. So if a website does go down, you still have the same thoughts, why you're doing it and why you're thinking about it. So let's go ahead and move over to a website now. So I want to take you to a website called Dhash. Now this is dhash.com. I do not expect you to be able to follow along at this point because this costs money. Okay, it's five bucks for a week. It's $150 for a year. This is only, it used to take credit card. They only now take Bitcoin, I do believe, or some sort of cryptocurrency. Absolutely worth it, in my opinion. Even get a week. Get a week, see if you like it. It's amazing. There are going to be tools I show you later on in the course that we'll go through and we can do it locally, like the one I just ran in the last video. I ran Breach Parse, right? This is something that I put together and, and set up, but and it's free, but the database isn't maintained. It's a slow search. I don't get the results back as instantly, and I can't tie it to as many data points as a website like this can. I think this website's great. Now, let's talk about what Dehash can do now that I'm logged in. We have the ability to search by, let me make this a little bit bigger. We have the ability to search by email, username, IP address, name, address, phone number, VIN. Okay, think about this. Say we know a email address. Okay, we know an email address. Say it's Bob, Bob at Tesla.com. We're not gonna search this yet. We take Bob and we know Bob it has an account and we're, we're looking for him. We search him, Bob shows up, and we see Bob shows up, and we see maybe his name, like Bob Jones or something like that, shows up. Maybe something that he's been leaked in has his address, or maybe there was an IP address tied to the client you're looking for or the person you're looking for. This can all be identified. What if Bob has a username? It's like Bob, Bob Rocks123. Okay, well, we can search that username in here and see if that username has repeated itself at all which is great. We could search by password. So say Bob's password was Bob Rocks 123. We could search that password and if it's unique enough, then maybe we can actually do some uh, advanced searching. Like if we go back to the example from last time, like this last video, we saw this 907DADE814. We could put that into a search engine and see if that comes back to something else, maybe that comes back to a user that is not at a tesla.com, but maybe it's like Bob at gmail.com. And then guess what? Now we have Bob's personal account, or now we have Bob tied to another email account, especially if we search by name or something that we can tie them together. We need to start being able to relate other accounts to each other. We can do that with hashing. We could do that with passwords. There's a lot of things that we can do, and we want to start tying this together. As a real world example, when I am looking at an organization and I'm doing research on, on hashing or I'm doing research on breach credentials, I'm trying to think, okay, first, if my client, if my client is tesla.com, I might come in here and search at tesla.com and I might come see how many results are in here. Let's see what happens. Okay, here's George at tesla.com. George has been in a shared data. So there's no actual, um, any detail, details here besides uh, a potential username, a name, email. Okay, same thing with safety. We'd have to scroll down and see if we can find something that, okay, here's Adobe. Now Adobe will have a, <laughs> there's actually a Bob at Tesla. Um, Bob at Tesla has a hash password here. Okay, so now we can say, well, first of all, we can go see if we can figure out what this hash is, which we'll talk about in a second. We can also go and say, okay, Bob, uh, does Bob exist anywhere else? Does this hash exist anywhere else on this website? Can we tie it to another account that maybe even if we don't crack the password, then we can say, okay, 
this Bob, this ties to Bob at gmail.com. So like I would note this down and I would take this and copy it. So from a real world example, I would take all the data that I see on this website. I would collect all of the passwords, all of the usernames, everything. So like Tesla nine, all of this. I want to know what the passwords are. I want to know who the people are. I want to know all the data because if I could start finding patterns, if I could start putting things together, maybe I can even relate these back to their personal email accounts like we're talking about. And then I could see password patterns there or other passwords and just start tying this down because my goal is to break into an organization. If I'm doing a pen test, my goal is to break into an organization. So I'm going to take that data and if I can find other passwords related to a personal account, I'm not going to go attempt to break into a personal account, but I will take that data and I will put it together and maybe try to break into uh, their work email account with those passwords of that information. This can tie to an investigation as well. If you're hunting down an individual, you're trying to tie them to other accounts. This is incredibly useful. If you can find their data in a breach database and have a password and that password's unique, you can search it, maybe find them somewhere else. You find an IP address, you find a name. There are often IP addresses in here, which we can tie to a location possibly. And see, here's that 9078 or DADE814. We could take this and maybe search it and see if it comes back anything. Who knows? Shark at Tesla, shark at Tesla, okay? Shark at mail.ru. Look, this is a new, new email address. We didn't know about this one before. And look, it does us a favor. We search D-A-D-E, but here's the capitalize. We didn't search for capitalize. We're not searching specific. Okay, and now we're getting more information. Look, here's one for Dropbox. Okay, so it tells you where this is coming from and how you can tie it in. If we can get any sort of name out of this, um, any sort of anything, that would be amazing. We can get a person's name or IP address and we can start tying them down. But when you're doing different searches like this, you need to start almost... Um, you know, like in the investigations where they have like the the red yarn and it's going from one pinpoint to another, you kind of have to zigzag that back and forth and really try to tie this down. And you'll see that when we get into reporting, how you might take one individual and really just see like a, a password tied to an account tied to this. And this was the exact methodology that we took to get to that point, because when you write a report, you want to make sure that. Uh, the investigative person or the say you're handing off to the police or whatever, uh, you want to make sure that the person that is doing what what you did or they can replicate what you did with ease. And there's no no question about it. Um, so this is some of the, the searching that we can do. Now, if we come to dehashed again, we can come here and we can search by email, username, um, name, anything. So you can put your name in here. I mean, if you want to search on here, I think it's great. You can come through here and just search for your name. Um, let's go back. Let's search Tesla again. I saw a hash in there. The Adobe hashes are kind of interesting. They're not the easiest to pick up, but let's see. Let's find this Adobe hash. So let's say we get a hash like this. Uh, we could try to identify what this hash is. We can try to crack this hash. We can see if it's been cracked somewhere else. Um, this hash, as of right now, we have no idea. But we know Bob at Tesla.com. We can maybe paste this in here, first of all, and see if it ties back to anything. And there's 22 results back. Um, you know, I would probably be looking for somebody that has this password um, with the name of Bob. It's probably not going to be like uh, a Brett or a Michael. Uh, you know, we might want to see if we can find another account somewhere else. But these are all tying down to a hash from Adobe. So depending on how they were hashing this data, we might not find anything else of interest. But you can see all the things here, all the different opportunities that are here for us to just do research and tie down information. Now we can go to a website called hashes.org. And if we come here, we have the capability to actually try to search for this hash. So we could search hashes and see if we can find it. Um, so you can come in here and just paste it. And again, it doesn't do a great job, in my opinion, with the Adobe hashes. Sometimes they crack, but a lot of times it says it can't find them. Um, oops, there we go. Let's try hitting a search here. OK, so it says not a valid hash. Now, if you put this into Google as a search. You can see it didn't come back with anything either. So we want to make sure that when we're searching this, you know, we we try all options. There is an Adobe database that if you do put in a hash and it does show up, 
there's a GitHub Adobe database that will actually show up here. So with that being said, this is kind of what I want you to start thinking about when we're hunting down breach credentials. How can I take a person or company that I'm looking into? So if you have a company, you can just go at company name.com or .net or whatever it is, search in here, see how they show up. If you have a person, maybe a personal email account, if you can find that person, if you know their email account, you come in here and say bob at gmail.com. Maybe you don't know what their their email address is. Then maybe you come here to the main page. You go, OK, I'm going to look for a name. I'm going to look for Bob Jones and search for that. And then you start taking this and trying to find the patterns. If you know Bob lives somewhere, uh, maybe you could find an address for Bob or maybe, you know, Bob lives in like Arizona. You could search Bob Jones and see if Bob shows up um, and then kind of take it from there. And there is some um, search operators that you can utilize. You can see Bob Jones is taking forever. You can put this in quotations and search it again um, and kind of narrow down your results here. So if we click on this, you could see like here's a name of <laughs> we got a lot of results, but here's the name of Bob Jones. This is a very common name. So um, but you could see like if we're trying to look this down, we can start searching and adding operators in here and trying to see if we can figure out to tie a username or something to them. So. Again, get your wheel spinning. Don't rely on just dehashed, but just rely on thinking about this. This is the thing you should be thinking about. Again, dehash could go down tomorrow. Um, but if you're thinking about it in, in the way that the credentials and the information can be interwoven, remember that red yarn again, that's really what I want you to take away from this. So we're going to do another video on this. I'm going to show you some more, I guess, tools that are out there and some other things that you can do, offer alternatives to this and then we'll wrap up this section. So I'll catch you over in the next video.